The first question you have to ask yourself in the pursuit of the study of Chinese is where in the world are the most talented people competing with one another to get this done? If you wanted to go into the theater, if you wanted to be an actor or an actress, it would be pretty easy for you to answer the question, where are the most talented people in the world competing with one another to go into filmmaking, to go into acting, to go into the performing arts, right? And you'd have one answer if you were interested in English language cinema, maybe a very different answer if you wanted German language cinema or Korean language cinema, whatever it may be. But it would not take you too terribly long to figure out where you should be living, where you should be working, and where you should be formally or informally studying. If you want to be an actor, if you want to compete with the best of the best in order to be the best that you can be yourself. Isn't it strange how in our culture we think of the arts as easy compared to the hard sciences, certainly compared to the study of languages. We think that going to an audition and trying to prove that you're more talented than every other actor or actress there, we think that's easy. All right, it's not. The performing arts are hard. Painting, drawing, the plastic arts, as we used to say, those are, those are hard too. All right. But they're hard in a way that makes it easy for us to conceptualize excellence and where we should live in the pursuit of excellence. Most people approach the study of Chinese, most people approach the study of any and every language with a very different set of criteria, a very different mentality. They start off by thinking, where can I study this language that's close to me, that's close to where I live, that's adjacent to somewhere I already have an apartment. <laughs> Where can I study Chinese that fits into the life, the lifestyle I've already got? Oh, well, isn't it funny how ready we all are to say, you'll never make it as an artist that way. You'll never be a painter. You'll never, never be an illustrator. You'll never be a musician. If that's your attitude towards learning music, or actually once you're past the, that initial phase, getting out and hearing other great musicians, being inspired by other great musicians, competing with great musicians, auditioning, and, you know, getting yourself a gig, going and playing live music yourself, even if it's in a small venue for a small audience where you're starting to build up, you know, build up your ability and your self-confidence as a musician. Isn't it strange what clarity of understanding we all seem to show when you're talking about music, acting, painting, sculpture, right? There is a place you need to be in the pursuit of excellence in those fields, even if you're not there as a student, right? There was a period of time, I think this period is now over, when anyone would have said to you, oh, look, if you want to be a jazz musician, it doesn't matter what school you go to, but you cannot stay in Colorado you cannot live in Colorado as a jazz musician. You cannot live in Saskatchewan as a jazz musician. It doesn't matter if you tell me there's a music conservatory with a good teacher who will work with you where you can learn jazz in Colorado or Saskatchewan. If you want to be a jazz musician, you would be better off washing dishes in New York City. Live in New York City, earn your money washing dishes, and then in your spare time, practice and play jazz yourself. Go to other people's gigs, hear other people playing, audition, get your own gigs. Like, just to live on Manhattan Island at the right period of time, that period of time is now over for jazz music, right? That was where you needed to be in the pursuit of excellence, in the pursuit of a career as a jazz musician. Now, not only New York City, not only Manhattan. I think there was a time when there was enough jazz music in Paris. There was enough jazz music in Berlin. Um, maybe at some stage there was enough jazz music in New Orleans. Maybe not. All right. There was a time and a place where you needed to be. 
And that mattered more than being enrolled in a prestigious college. And it certainly mattered more than being enrolled in a third-rate college from a small town, a university nobody's heard of, nobody gives a fuck about, where you're studying for a diploma or degree. Nobody gives a fuck about. Okay, here's the problem. This is now the end of 2022, going into the year 2023. Right now, if you ask the question, where in the world are the most talented people competing with one another to get it done? Okay, you got an act, you've got an answer for acting, for filmmaking, for cinema, right? Oh, that's a where are the most talented people in the world competing to get that done? I don't have to tell you the answer to that question. If you've never thought about it before, <laughs> how many hours of research is it going to take you to ask the question? Okay, okay. Taking a student who speaks English as their first language and who does not know any other Asian language and making them fluent in Chinese. Speaking, reading, writing Chinese. It's an unbelievably challenging task, right? And, and note the specificity with which I said that, okay? Taking a Korean student and teaching them Chinese, completely different challenge. Taking a Japanese student and teaching them Chinese, totally different challenge. I'm not, I'm not saying that's trivial or easy, but it is not comparable to uh, a Latino kid Let's see, you got an Hispanic kid, a Latino kid who grew up in New York City, doesn't know any Asian language, has some familiarity with Spanish, grew up going to school in English. How is that kid going to attain mastery of Chinese? Where are the people who at the highest levels of talent and motivation are competing to get that done? Right now, nobody knows. Nobody can answer that question. In 1978, it was the island of Taiwan. If you talk to some very elderly professors now, they may still pass on to you the sense of wonder of what Taiwan used to be. Okay, It's over. It's gone. <laughs> when exactly that ended? Did it end in 1982 or 1985? Doesn't matter. But yes, there was a period when Taiwan was the place to be for people learning Chinese, whether they wanted to be scholars or wanted to go into business, whatever field they were, they were interested in. Okay, if you talk to some real elderly people now, they will remember a golden era in Hong Kong. Okay, it is over. There are no easy answers today as to where you can learn Chinese. And the question of where matters much more than like being enrolled, having any kind of status or any kind of degree. All right. Uh, now, I'll just give two real quick examples here. If you knew a town anywhere in the United States where they had a Chinese language program that was banging, that was the best in the world, all right, in the same sense that an aspiring jazz musician could go to, a, could go to work in a restaurant, go to wash dishes in a restaurant, and still really make progress in his career as a jazz musician if he were in the right place at the right time. You know, uh, In that same sense, if there were a, true, a center of excellence for the study of Chinese, for the teaching of Chinese, anywhere in the United States of America, you could go there, you could, you could work in an Amazon warehouse as a part-time job, get some part-time job completely unrelated to the study of Chinese. And just by being there, right, and just by going to those events, and showing up and participating, right, without paying a dime in tuition, right, you could also learn Chinese. You could also be part of that phenomenon. Now, you guys may not know this, but I've been to university towns all over the world. I mean, it's true even here. I'm in a, a third-rate university town right now. Truly, truly. Not first-rate, not second-rate. I'm in a third-rate university town right now. But um, there are so many events here you could show up and participate in. If there were other talented, hardworking students or teachers, something you could jump on to. You could be part of a snowball of excellence going on, however you want to think of it this way. Um, but it's not. This is a terrible place to study Chinese. It's, it's absolutely awful. Um, this might be easier for you guys to, to visualize when we're talking about a place like Beijing. We're talking about a place like Shanghai. We're talking about a place in China. Um, what if someone said to you, look, you would be better off enrolling in a business program in Shanghai, enrolling in a business program in Beijing, 
just studying how to make money on the stock market or whatever they teach you in this business program, studying something completely unrelated to Chinese, but you're living in Beijing or you're living in Shanghai and now you're in the right place at the right time to learn Chinese and you can make this kind of progress, like despite, despite your day job, despite this irrelevant university uh, credential you're enrolled in getting. Now, you know, the examples don't end there. Maybe you could get a job, a job working as a hotel manager in Beijing, a hotel manager working in Shanghai. For someone else, that job would be a dead end. But for you, if you're motivated, it could be the positive opportunity of a lifetime. It could be more valuable than getting a PhD at Oxford University, England. It could be more valuable than getting a PhD at a third-rate university here in Canada in some small town in the United States just because you are putting yourself in the right place at the right time. Here's the problem, guys. Um, right now, I think moving to Beijing is a really bad idea. Right now, I think moving to Shanghai is a really bad idea. Right now, moving to uh, Taipei is a really bad idea. Right now, there are no easy answers for Chinese. Everything going on in Western academia is a disaster. This is, um, this is a department that has lost its soul. I mean, this is a deeply broken, deeply misguided tradition of education. And, you know, you can make an argument that Chinese language education in the Western world was better in the 1880s than it is today. All right? Um, there, <laughs> I don't think I can get into a full discussion of late 19th century Asian studies and how languages were taught and learned in the 1880s compared to the 1980s, and in the 1980s compared to 2022. Um, you know, obviously, in many ways, university education in the 19th century was flawed. I mean, it was openly sexist and racist. There were some very obvious problems with it in that sense. Okay, but the idea of what the process was of learning a language by sitting down with a tutor Back in the 1880s, the ideal of language education, I would say, was derived from the study of ancient Greek and Latin with, um, <laughs> with the locus classicus being, with the, the kind of example in everyone's mind being, um, one student sitting down with one tutor, or maybe two or three students sitting down with one tutor, and very carefully reading through uh, Euclid's geometric theorems. Right, where you sit in a small group, okay, very slowly we're going to read this together with a whole lot of face-to-face -face care and attention. Now, that model of education, I already mentioned, it was racist. It was sexist. It worked for a small number of people. <laughs> that was replaced by a sausage factory, most people would say. And the problem is it doesn't even make sausages. Um, you know, we can't say that we're comparing handmade sausages to factory-made sausages. At this point, we're talking about a system of education that started out with handmade sausages that attempted to industrialize itself to become a kind of mass production sausage factory. And all of this money was going into this sausage factory. And it seemed to be that nobody noticed that there weren't any sausages coming out anymore. The university system we have does not produce people who are capable of reading Chinese. It does not produce people who are capable of writing Chinese. It does not produce people who have speaking ability and listening comprehension Chinese, period. Um, now, the question of to what extent our system of education is broken in the teaching of theater, acting. Very good question. Kind of a separate question, in my opinion, but it's an interesting context. To what extent do our universities fail to teach business administration, an MBA program? To what extent do they teach you to be a stockbroker in plain English? To what extent do they teach you to really be able to make trades on the stock market? I have looked into that. It's a very good question. All right. Um, to what extent is anyone really prepared for a career in, in either the creative arts, the creative arts as they exist today, like filmmaking as it exists today in the real world on YouTube? For example, 
to what extent is anyone prepared to deal with the reality of economics in the real world by the university system? Interesting questions, and you're going to come up with pretty complex answers if you do the research, if you're, if you're serious about this. The problem is, when you're talking about the study of Chinese, this is an absolute zero out of ten, guys. This isn't relative failure. This is total system failure. Now, I, this video is just about Chinese. I'm not going to digress into asking the question about Sanskrit, but it's a very good comparison to add. What was the quality of Sanskrit education in Europe in the 1880s? You know, look at the scholars it produced and under what conditions and what kind of education they had. You know, um, you know Saussure of uh, Saussurean linguistics. Look at what the reality was of, of language education of this kind in Germany. You know what I mean? In <laughs> the late 19th century. Basically, late 19th century through World War I. <laughs> How was Sanskrit taught and studied and mastered? What was the tutorial process? Okay. Well, there were no cell phones. Okay, there were no laptop computers, and they did not have one professor lecturing a theater of 300 or 400 students, right? There were, it's not just the difference between handmade sausages and a, and a sausage factory that we're talking about here, guys. Um, now, look, the other problem is this. Many of you will have been watching this video with the false assumption that I'm an old man lecturing teenagers because people assume that only teenagers are capable of the study of foreign languages, especially an extremely challenging uh, language like Chinese. A, a language that takes extraordinary levels of self-discipline, commitment of your time, focused efforts, so on and so forth. Okay, well, you know, guess what? It's much easier for a middle-aged person to learn Chinese than a teenager. It is easier to learn Chinese at age 30, 40, or 50 than it is to learn Chinese at age 16, or age 26. If you don't believe me, because a lot of people subscribe to these kind of self-serving pseudo-scientific notions that you can only learn a language when you're young. Okay, really quick thought experiment. What if I said to you, I'm not going to teach you a new language at all. You and I both speak English as our first language, but I am going to teach you to write English using a complex orthographic code. I'm going to teach you to use your handwriting to write your thoughts in English, not in English, but in a series of complex symbols that are incomprehensible to other people so that you can send a handwritten letter in code and nobody else can read it. When the recipient gets it, they'll decode the symbols. Okay? So it's not a language. It's just English, but there's a process of encoding and decoding you're going to learn how to do. It's ultimately going to involve your handwriting. Do you think it would be easier for me to teach someone to read and write a secret code if they were 16, if they were 26, or if they were 36? If you're really being honest with yourself, the type of self-discipline that learning a language requires in every way, it's easier to do as a middle-aged person. And yet, we have this stereotype that this type of learning, this type of commitment can only be done at an early age. Why? I'm going to fucking tell you why. Young people are incapable of being lazy. Yeah, I said it. Young people are not lazy. They are restless. Because they do not know what it means to be happy yet. Teenagers are restless. They want to be happy. You put them, in a, put them on a stool in a classroom. You, know, you force them to sit there and study for an exam. They're unhappy. They're restless. They're casting around their mind and their body. They're fidgeting. They're wondering what they can do to make themselves happy instead of being so miserable, sitting there and being forced to study, sitting there being forced to write exams, doing all kinds of things they don't want. Okay. A lot of middle-aged people interpret that as laziness. All right. I am telling you right now, the, the average American teenager is incapable of being lazy. All right. What they are is rapacious, 
for a type of happiness they've never experienced, a type of happiness they can't even really understand yet. They may dream about it, they may imagine it, right? But to them, it remains something fundamentally unknown. That is the energy of what it is to be a teenager. Right? Middle-aged people know what it is to be happy. They know the sweetness of this life all too well. So it becomes very, very difficult to motivate them to commit to suffer, to commit to do without all of the things that will make them happy. For just five hours, for just five hours a day on Saturday and Sunday to study Chinese, for example, instead of doing the things that they know will make them happy on a Saturday, on a Sunday, right? Think about how extraordinary it is. Think about how rare it is for a middle-aged person just to make that level of commitment 10 hours a week, okay? Now, what if it's not 10 hours a week? What if instead it's, you know, five hours a day, seven days a week? What if it's a much higher level of intensity of study? Of course, if they could make that commitment, middle-aged people would learn a greater quality of Chinese, a greater quantity of Chinese. They learn much more if they could make that commitment. But they know too well already the sweetness of this life, whatever it may be for them, whatever pleasures it is that they are addicted to, be they shallow or profound. A middle-aged man who knows what it is to lie in a hammock is the hardest man on earth to motivate to undertake the study of Chinese, to motivate to undertake the fighting of a war for the future of democracy. Okay? He has become incapable of self-sacrifice. He has become incapable of heroism because he knows the pleasures of this life too well. And the average teenager, however stupid, however reckless, however fidgety, however easily distracted, the average teenager is very easy to motivate. Not just to motivate them to be self-sacrificing, to have so-called delayed gratification, to undertake great works, great effort for a long period of time for future positive outcomes. It's very easy to motivate teenagers to suicidal acts of heroism. And that is why the military preys upon them. That's why every cult group and religion preys upon them. That's why even mainstream political movements try to recruit them and make them into their, their minions. Okay. The actual talent required to learn a language is a talent each and every one of us has. What you are lacking is on the one hand the milieu. The same way, if you want to be a great jazz musician, you want to be a great painter, you want to be a great sculptor, you have to put yourself in that milieu. You're better off being a dishwasher or working part-time in an Amazon warehouse if you can live in the right milieu, the right context, the right scenario, right? What you're lacking on the one hand is, is the milieu, and on the other hand, the motivation. Not so much the motivation to do the work, to do the studying, to do the practice, to learn the language, right? But the motivation to forego the sweetness of this life, which for some of you is a sweetness that you know a little bit too well.